Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about freeway merging onto a interstate motorway or freeway, obviously, and how to do that and not die. That's what we're going to talk about today and show you how to do that correctly. Stick around. We'll be right back with that information. Hi there, Smart Drivers. Welcome back. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about freeway merging and how to do that safely and not die. And I can see we're a bit bright here, so I'm just going to turn down the brightness. So just bear with me for one second. And Corey is here. Corey is the moderator. He is in Winnipeg, Man Manitoba there. I just turned that down a little bit. Save. There we go. And June is here from Michigan. Salah is here. Hello, everyone. And the reason I'm talking about freeway merging is I just got back from Victoria and obviously did some merging and was thinking about that and how to explain that better to people and thought that I would give this another go and, and talk to people about freeway merging and whatnot so that I can help you out. And Adco, how are you? Excellent. There's a few people here. And if you're just tuning in, uh, let us know where you're tuning in from and what class of license that you're going for and we'll be able to help you out. Uh, regardless of what class of license you're going for, whether it's motorcycle, car, truck, or bus, and it is that time of year where some people are going for their motorcycle license. So Jerry's here. He's from Dallas, Texas. Hello in Dallas, and thanks for that, Corey, letting me know that the uh, audio and the visual is good here. There we go. I got a couple of little things here I'm working on. Yep. Okay. And... Uh, so any questions you have about a license as well, the past your road test first time course is on sale. You can get the coupon down there in the description for 30% off that and check that over at the Smart Drive Test website. And as well, Corey will put the link up for you for that as well. Great course, it'll simple, easy, pass your road test first time and you'll know all the answers as well. Uh, I'm the one that designed the course and I've been a driving instructor for 20 years and I know exactly what you are going to be asked on a driving test and the three basic maneuvers that you're going to be required to do on a road test regardless of where you are in North America regardless of what state you are in the US at minimum you're going to be required to do parallel parking three-point turn and reverse stall parking or backing into a parking space as it's called so that's what you're going to end up doing for the purposes of a road test so Sarah's here from Dallas Texas as well uh, Angeli is from Toronto Canada and Mall is here from South Carolina in the US excellent Adco Indiana today class A but looking forward to another great chat and yes if you have any questions at all Adco about class A license uh, tractor trailer unit uh, we can certainly help you with that as well and you're there in the Midwest in Indiana awesome uh, Samia I am really good and yourself I'm a little bit tired got up early this morning to get on the ferry so but uh, you know a long drive back but I got back and here we are so just passed my written test a couple of days ago and first attempt Samia that's excellent awesome congratulations on that so without further ado I'm gonna move over to the PowerPoint presentation here and get that going and Michael's here from Jackson, Michigan. Uh, and yes, a few other people here. So lots of people here. Excellent. Okay. Let's get over here and get this going here. So just bear with me while I get this up for you. Uh, yes, there we go. Freeway merging. Here we go. So talking about this a little bit because I was coming back from Vancouver Island, which is on the west coast of Canada, uh, also called the... Um, it's not called something else It's part of the, the Gulf Islands on the west coast of Canada and I, I'm trying to think of what it's called in the US because I always try <laughs> give compliments to the US as well so anyway let's talk about freeway merging that's where I was coming back from and I was doing I was driving on the Trans Canada Highway and doing some merging and I thought this was a really good topic that we could talk about today so I'll get on the right screen here there we go uh, video I got up this week uh, was an interview I did with Jen and uh, it was about her seeing disability she has 2100 driving and was going back to get a license and I gave her some help with that down there in Washington State so if you haven't seen the video definitely have a look at that video there as well and I've had a lot of people uh, talk about merging mishaps on freeways and those types of things and particularly one of the videos that I still need to get done is merging onto a freeway in congested or backed up traffic 
and I you know the the best analogy that I can give people and students who are learning how to drive uh, in terms of merging onto a freeway is yes the onus of responsibility for merging safely is on the merging driver but it's one of those things that as you're coming out on the on-ramp you got to be looking for your space on the freeway that you're going to be merging into and that is imperative because you got to manage speed so you have to adjust your speed so you can meet that spot and one of the other aspects of merging onto a freeway and one of the one of the smart drivers said this the other day they were watching the changing lanes video and Corey put that up for you as well that they find it one of the most intimidating and most difficult and challenging aspects of driving to do and merging onto freeways is something similar that you're changing lanes from the acceleration lane on the freeway onto the main lane of traffic on the freeway interstate or motorway depending on where you are in the world and it can be intimidating because you're traveling at high speeds um, you know most interstates most freeways are going to be 60 miles an hour plus 100 kilometers an hour plus uh, the Trans Canada in many places is 120 kilometers an hour so it's closer to 70 miles an hour and that can be intimidating for drivers because you're moving at very high speed uh, one of the things that might help you out is is that when you accelerate you put the fuel pedal right on the floor and get that thing going as fast as you can and one of the reasons I, that kind of got me thinking about this was I was coming out of Hope uh, stopped to get fuel and uh, it's a when you come out of Hope and merge back onto the Trans Canada Highway you're going uphill <laughs> which makes it a bit more difficult for the buggy to get going because as you know the buggy's an old car <laughs> and you got to put it right on the floor well I was kind of tootling along there and I had it in fourth gear and I was doing about 80 kilometers an hour and I was behind a tractor trailer unit and I looked in the mirror and there's a tractor trailer unit like right beside me and the tractor trailer unit that's beside me is not going to slow down because the the driver is loaded the truck is loaded and if the driver slows down on the hill he or she is just not going to get that truck going going again so this is one of the reasons that the driver probably didn't let off in the throttle so basically what I did when I saw that driver beside me and I knew I had to merge in between him and the truck that was in front of him uh, basically I threw it into third gear on the on the on the buggy and just put it on the floor and got it going as fast as I could and this was about halfway down the acceleration lane so I still had plenty of room to accelerate and you know but accelerate really aggressively to get the vehicle going so I could get in front of that other tra tractor trailer unit all right so that's the story and that's what inspired me to do this again this freeway merging video and uh, for those of you who don't know me Rick August I do have a PhD I have been a driving instructor for 20 years and for those of you who don't know what driving instructors do we do we teach you how to pass a road test and uh, we do teach you some driving skills as well and unfortunately some driving instructors believe that if they teach you how to pass the road test they also teach you how to drive which isn't true because uh, driving after a license is a very different animal than driving in preparation for passing a road test and it's interesting uh, just quick story here some years ago when I worked for ICBC which is the licensing authority here in the province of British Columbia in Canada they sent me down to do a ride along with the driving examiners and it was interesting because the driving examiners they knew I was a driving instructor and we're sort of riding around in the car and we're following a motorcycle because it was a motorcycle test and they're like and we do this and we do that and you know we do this and that and I just kept saying yes I know you do that I know you do that and I know you do this right there were things that they were doing that they were getting the the rider to do and I was like you know after I left I kind of shook my head and went what do driving examiners think that driving instructors do I mean, because that's we know what driving examiners do so this goes back to my past your road test first course I'm gonna give you the exact formula for passing your road test and the absolute fundamental skills that you need to be successful in getting your license all right so as I said in the introduction of this that freeway merging can be intimidating because you're traveling at high speeds and you're changing lanes now one of the things I'm gonna say about that is, is that when you're changing lanes and if you get the vehicle up to speed which on most freeways uh, there's an on-ramp and then there's the acceleration lane and you know it's the acceleration lane because on the left side are what's called continuity lines the road markings and continuity lines the lane markings between the lanes between the acceleration lane and the main uh, highway are 
half as long and twice as wide. So you know their continuity lines. And what that means is if they're on the left side of your vehicle, the lane you're in is either going to end or exit. So it's important that you pay attention to the road markings and know that you're on the acceleration lane. But on most on-ramps and acceleration lanes, by the time you get to the acceleration lane, you should already be 50, 60 miles an hour. You should already be 80 to 100 kilometers an hour because most on-ramps allow you to gain some speed before you even get out onto the acceleration lane. So that's the other thing I'm gonna tell you about this. Now, obviously, this is difficult for many drivers because you need to combine the four components of driving and passing a road test. Speed management, you need to manage speed so that you can find your space and match your space. And then you need to manage space around your vehicle relative to the speed of other vehicles that are already on the freeway. You need to observe, you need to shoulder check, and you need to be shoulder checking at high speeds. And you can't hang out with the shoulder check because you gotta be looking forward as well. In this image here, there's a lineup of cars that are moving to merge out onto the freeway. So you gotta watch the vehicle directly in front of you as well as the vehicles to the side. And then finally, you need to communicate well. So it's important that as soon as you get on the on-ramp, like back where this sign, this cautionary sign is that you need to merge, you should have your signal on indicating to traffic on the roadway that you're gonna be moving over. Uh, one of the statements I often get from students is that, oh, other drivers won't let me over. And they just, you know, they're arrogant and they won't do this and they won't do that. And it's like, well, did you put your signal on and ask? Because 90% of drivers on the roadway, if you put your signal on and you move over, uh, or you put your signal on and you move to move over, most of the time, driver's gonna let you in, regardless of what city you're in. I know some people will say, oh, I live in New York or I live in LA. People don't do that, that's it, not true. I've driven in those cities and it's the same thing. If you put your signal on and you have a minimum of three flashes, most of the time somebody's gonna help you out. All right, uh, one of the points that I need to iterate is, is that the onus of responsibility for merging is on the merging driver. Yes, it's a team sport and sometimes drivers on the highway or the freeway interstate, they're gonna help you out. They will let off the throttle a little bit and let you merge in front of them or they'll, if they can, they'll move over to the other lane. But still, in the end, the onus responsibility is on you. And another video clip that I think came on Facebook last week, actually no, it was on LinkedIn. And I wanted to try and get the dash cam footage because uh, what had happened was is the new driver obviously got out on the acceleration lane and then sh she froze and She just held her course held her speed and there was a truck there, but it was just a bobtail It was a truck without a trailer on the back and this this driver didn't even let off the throttle a little bit And all he had to do was let off the throttle a little bit and she would have merged in front of him but instead she drove into the side of them spun the car around and then there was a head-on collision with the other traffic and I'm thinking to myself, you know, that driver in the truck is supposed to be a professional and all he or she had to do was let off the throttle a little bit, she would emerge in front of him. But no, because the crash resulted, you're now risking half a dozen lives on the freeway because she spun around and ended up facing oncoming traffic. So think about that if you're the other driver and you are holding tight that I have the right of way and I don't have to move over and I don't have to slow down for these people. Just think about what a couple of seconds out of your, you know, taking your foot off the throttle, how many lives you could potentially save, all right? So speed management, the other, the other thing about speed management is, is that when you are driving down the freeway, it's very predictable about where the on-ramps are and where the off-ramps are. And uh, these freeways, interstates, motorways, they're called limited, limited access highways because there's only certain places you can get on and off. So when you're driving down the freeway, be looking for the on-ramps, be looking for the off-ramps, looking for the vehicles that are coming out onto the roadway because if there's a tractor trailer coming out there and they're loaded, they're not gonna let off, they're not gonna slow down, they're just gonna signal and they're gonna move, start moving over into your lane. So you either wanna give them some space by adjusting your speed or you wanna try and move over to the other lane to let them in. Now, as the person merging onto the freeway, as I said, you need to mash down on that throttle. You need to get the vehicle going. And most automatics, actually all automatic vehicles uh, fitted with automatic transmissions, once you mash the fuel pedal to the floor, it's gonna go into overdrive and it is gonna sound like you're launching the space shuttle. So know that. 
Uh, and basically what it does is it shifts down to second gear for maximum acceleration and you need to do that. And as well, have a look at this video here on tra uh, traffic predictions on freeways and those types of things. And basically what you need to do is you need to match or go faster than the traffic on the highway and then merge out onto the freeway, interstate or highway. Communication, signal as early as possible. Leave your signal on until you're completely in the lane that you're merging out into. Uh, if you don't have daylight running lights, turn your headlights on. That way it activates uh, the taillights as well on your vehicle and, and, and you're more visible to other traffic. And then finally, if you're driving a bigger vehicle, if you have a pickup truck with a trailer on it that's loaded or you've got an RV unit or a boat or something like that, turn your four-way flashers on when you come out there and you're trying to gain speed. This is what most truck drivers will do, especially if they're loaded and they're coming out onto the acceleration lane and they're trying to get as much speed as they can. They'll just put their four ways on. So if you see that, you know that the vehicle is loaded. They're going to go most of the time, you know, good drivers are going to go right to the acceleration lane and get as much speed as they can. And even in a tractor trailer unit, you can still get it up to about 80 kilometers an hour, about 50 miles an hour. So know that as well. Uh, that if you got a larger vehicle, put your four-way flashers on to indicate to other traffic that you're not going to get right up to match the speed. Okay, shoulder checking. You need to hold your course. You need to shoulder check quick, quickly, uh, sharp 90 degree head turn because you need to watch the traffic to your left If we're, for those of us driving on the right side of the road, which is our smallest blind area around the vehicle and you need to keep track of the vehicles in front of you as well so for example when I was coming at a hope and I was going up the hill there I saw the truck in front of me and I was just in kind of behind him and then I looked 90 degrees and there's the truck right beside me as well and so I got to kind of measure the space you got to measure the gap between the two vehicles and then match your speed so you can hit that space between those two vehicles uh, mirror adjustment you want to have be able to see in the mirrors as well and if you have difficulty checking your blind areas uh, buy some con convex mirrors and you can go on to the smart drive test Amazon shop and pick those up as well and they just stick on in the corner and those will help you out as well for seeing into the blind areas around your vehicle now observation as you're coming down the on-ramp be looking for the space that you're going to merge into you can see here on this on-ramp and this is uh, there are some places in the United States where they will have stop signs on the ramp and unfortunately what that does it kind of creates a bottleneck on the on-ramp and makes it difficult but you can also see here in this image uh, that uh, there's very few uh, there's very little on, uh, acceleration lane actually there's no acceleration lane here so you, it's difficult to merge onto this uh, this isn't a true on off ramp per se in terms of the freeway here and so it's going to make it a bit more difficult but you need to aim for the space you need to signal early you need to watch for the traffic in front of you as well that it doesn't come to a stop for whatever reason so that you can get into your space safely okay space management watch the vehicle in front of you on the acceleration keep your distance manage your space on the acceleration and if you're running out of space for example this one here uh, you can see the image here with the car right up beside the tractor trailer unit that car should have merged in behind the tractor trailer unit is basically what that car should have done that car should not be up beside that tractor trailer unit right at the beginning uh, so this is what you need to do oftentimes what you're going to need to do with tractor trailer units you're going to need to pull in behind them not in front of them because uh, a lot of drivers of tractor trailer units are not going to let off the throttle so that's what you need to do for that and we can answer more questions about that all right so if you've got a road test come up good luck on that and if you're merging out onto the freeway uh, you know take these tips and implement them and keep yourself safe so we're gonna uh, head back over here there we go transition and we'll answer any questions you have about merging onto freeways keeping yourself safe and there's Colin good afternoon Michael clutch clutch <laughs> I must be entering into the middle of uh, into the middle of a conversation here uh, Samia, who is a good instructor in Lake Worth, Florida? Uh, Samia, now here's a good question, and I've had this question before with drivers here. Just bear with me one sec. I'm just going to adjust the video here a little bit. Just turn up that. Uh, there we go. All right. So if you're looking for a driving school and you're looking for a driving instructor to work with you uh, on your road test preparation 
go on Google, look at the ratings that they have on Google, okay? And pick one that has a four plus rating. If you have some trepidation or if you have some anxiety about your driving and your road test, then look for a driving instructor that works with seniors. Most of the time, they're really good at working with people who have some anxiety and trepidation around driving. So that's my recommendation in terms of looking for a driving school is go on Google and see what their rating is on Google because if they're a good school, they're gonna get a good rating on Google, all right? Okay, Aaron, already did this. New DMV is great in the area, easy to drive through. There you go, okay. Uh, my test lasted about five minutes, it was so fast. Who gives? Yeah, and some of them are in the larger metropolitan areas. The test, the road tests are only gonna be about eight to 10 minutes. Uh, I know that Sam, who works uh, in uh, Rookie Auto Driving School there in the Bronx, most of his road tests are less than eight minutes, okay? So it's basically a short drive. Uh, they get you to parallel park, uh, reverse stall park, and that's basically it. Okay, lots going on here. Uh, Sammy, you're going to definitely pass your road test. There we go. Okay. So Michael, uh, class A exam on the 29th. So you got that coming up this week. Excellent. So uh, good luck with that. Epic. For those on-ramp situations, it depends on what type of freeway you are merging onto. If it's a modern interstate except a wider acceleration lane, but 50s narrow. Take caution, drove US 22. Okay, so US, uh, United States uh, <laughs> State Road in Pennsylvania, that's what I was trying to say, epic. Uh, those are not true interstates and freeways, and oftentimes what's gonna happen is it's gonna look like an interstate, but in fact, it's not an interstate. It's not a limited access highway. It's the same thing that number 17 that runs east-west through New York that a lot of people take to get to New York City that's not a true uh, interstate or a freeway. It's if, if a freeway or a highway that you're on has traffic lights and signs and intersections and those types of things, it's just a highway. It's not a freeway. So if you're on a US a state road in the US, uh, it's not uncommon that you're going to get uh, inadequate acceleration lanes and those types of things. But know that oftentimes on these state roads, the speed limit is going to be less. It's not going to be 60 miles an hour. It's not going to be 100 kilometers an hour as it is here in Canada and those types of things. So know that as well. Okay, uh, clutch, clutch. Yeah, <laughs> Michael, you're working on your shifting and unfortunately that eclipses the other parts that you need to be working on and getting into your head. Uh, is there any part that you feel needs to be strengthened up, Michael, before your road test there on the 29th? All right, let's see who else we got here. Brian is in Binghamton, New York. Excellent. There we go. Hamza, uh, you give great information. Thanks for that. Uh, just passed my road test last week. It was nerve wracking. Who gives? Excellent. Congratulations on passing your road test there. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you head over to the Smart Drive Test website and sign up for the 100K campaign and enter yourself in the draw for the $100 fuel card. Uh, last April's winner was I'm going to screw this up because <laughs> it, it just escaped me for just a minute. It'll come back to me. Mrs. Hernandez, that's her name. Uh, and she's got a first name and I forget what it is, but I'll, it'll come back to me here in just a moment. Sammy, I just passed my written. Yeah, we already talked about that. Excellent. Okay. And there is my friend Sam from Rookie Auto Driving School. <laughs> Sam saying I heard my name. Yes, we were talking about road tests there, Sam, in uh, the Bronx and how short they are. You were saying before that they're only eight to 10 minutes. Uh, one of the smart drivers here said that uh, their road test was only five minutes and it was really quick. So uh, yeah, some of these road tests in the larger metropolitan areas are very short because they have a lot of people, a lot of students that they need to get through. So they shorten the road test so they can examine more students over the course of the day. That's what they end up doing. Uh, so instead of here in British Columbia and in Ontario and other states in the United States, instead of doing two or three an hour, they're gonna be doing five or six an hour, which is going to be a lot more students. So that's what's gonna happen. All right. Um, so freeway merging, for, and I'll just go back to this in terms of a road test. For many of you, you're not going to be required to do freeway merging for the purposes of a road test. I mean, unless the driving exam or examination center is very close to an interstate or a freeway, it's very unlikely that you're going to be doing that. 
Uh, driving examiners know for the most part that that's something they're gonna let you figure out after you get your license. They're not gonna make you do it for the purposes of your road test. If you are taking driving lessons with a local driving school or with a driving instructor, then they'll take you out and they'll kind of go over that with you. But for the most part, on a driving test, they're not going to make you. Uh, they're not going to make you do a freeway merge, and they're probably not going to get you to drive on a highway unless there's access to a highway. In some cases, they will, but for the most part, they're not going to do that. But it's one of those things that you need to be prepared for just in case because you have to understand that all of these other maneuvers on a road test uh, two-point reverse turn uh, highway driving freeway merging this is all up to the discretion of the examiner and there's a fair part of uh, there's a fair bit of discretion allowed on the part of the examiner so know that as well all right Brian I just did my five hour class. I'm trying to schedule my road test, but upstate is always on the weekend, it, but it's always on the weekend. So, so Brian, they're only doing, um, uh, they're only doing road tests on the weekend there in Binghamton, New York. And for those of you who aren't <laughs> familiar with the state of New York, it's kind of an ups it's kind of a upside down sideways L and anything sort of above New York City they call it ups, upstate so Binghamton New York is in upstate New York is what they call it okay epic uh, it's substandard freeway with 1950 standard design do you want me to send you a street view of the road that I'm talking about in Easton Pennsylvania very risk of learning learning learner driver on a freeway yeah but um, epic that road that you're referring to does it have intersections does it have uh traffic lights on it and those types of things because if it does then it's it's not a freeway in the true definition of what a freeway is okay uh brian i want to use my car but i'll need a licensed driver to go with me i can't drive myself yes that's true brian that you will and as well if you're going to use your own car brian and Corey will put the video up here for you make sure that you do a pre-trip inspection on your vehicle and give it a clean before you go down as well you know, clean up the inside, give it a vacuum, wash the outside and those types of things. Make sure that the seat belts are working and all, everything's working because uh, one of the other things in terms of a road test is they will do a pre-trip inspection, a mini pre-trip inspection on your vehicle regardless of it, whether it's your own personal vehicle or whether it's a driving school car. They'll check the lights, they'll check the brake lights, they'll check the horns. If it's raining out, they'll make sure the windshield, wash, uh, windshield wipers work and those types of things. So make sure that you're not denied your test because something isn't working. And I've uh, unfortunately seen that at uh, driving test centers where, for example, here in British Columbia, if somebody brings in a car from Alberta, which is the next province over, uh, they're not required to have license plates on the front of their vehicle. And if, if that happens, you're going to be denied your road test. And as unfortunately, in the last couple of weeks, I had a student who said that one of their lights was out, one of the taillights was out on the vehicle. They didn't have the tools to fix the light. It's a fair, in most cases, it's a fairly simple fix. So make sure that you do the pre-trip inspection the day before, and that way if you notice that there's a light out or there's something wrong with the vehicle, you can take it to the shop and get it fixed. Because, um, <laughs> funny story, uh, I did a video that I didn't put up on how to change a headlight. Because on my Honda, changing the headlights is easy. It's you can change both the headlights out in probably less than five minutes and then uh, I had a friend look at the video and he said well basically it's just a video about changing headlights on a on a Honda CRV so I went on the internet and I looked up some of the other vehicles uh, about changing headlights and there's like the new Chevy Malibu literally it took a licensed mechanic an hour to change the headlight you basically had to take the whole front quarter panel off off the car it's just crazy just if you get a chance and you're interested look it up because uh, I was I was just flabbergasted I was like what kind of technology do we, we have I was completely then he's just like oh do this and I was like it was crazy how how much work it was to change the headlight on it so yeah okay obnoxious yeah I remember being denied about three times because of something yeah and that's unfortunate so make sure you do a pre-trip inspection and there's the video that Corey put up for you Brian, it's great, safe. I it, uh, just got it from the dealership. Yeah, but Brian, don't trust the dealership. Make sure you do the pre-trip inspection on it. <laughs> don't trust dealerships. And don't trust anybody else, especially when you're going for a road test because, you, you know, uh, the light could go out on the way down. 
So just make sure it, it could potentially, but it's not likely, but make sure you do. Uh, <laughs> obnoxious. I bet that received a bad CR rating. I, 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 it did. Some of the comments I saw on the YouTube video I was watching were just scathing against the Malibu. I was like, that's crazy. Uh, yeah, so Sammy, I tried to drive yesterday, but I fell, felt for it was difficult to properly visualize the distance between car and curb. And yeah, and that's just going to take some practice, uh, Sammy. And basically what I would suggest to you is to make sure you do the exercises in the learn to drive video and Corey will put that up for you as well. Have a look at that and that'll help you out there. Okay. About the new Honda that is, um, I don't, I don't know what the rating is on the new Hondas, uh, obnoxious. I know that they get really good fuel mileage, but I'm not sure about their safety rating or how to change headlights and those types of things. I haven't looked it up. I probably need to do that. Uh, so, so if anybody has any, uh, suggestions about, uh, suggestions for topics that they would like me to do in terms of road tests and that that sort of thing let me know and leave me a comment down in the comment section there uh, I did get a hold of an SUV so this week I'm going to be doing videos on how to drive larger vehicles and give you some tips and ideas and strategies about how to drive a bigger vehicle and if you're a newer driver with not a lot of experience I would really recommend that you do these fundamental exercises and one of those was uh, the two by four exercise where you just get a chunk of two by four and you go out to a parking lot and you put it down on the road or down on the ground rather and you try and get the steer tires up over it or the, the passenger side tires up over it and you get the driver side tires up over that uh, in both forward and in reverse and that's going to help you out in learning where your vehicle is in space and place because this is the biggest challenge for students is where is your vehicle in space and place and being able to get the tires up over on that two by four is really going to help you learn where the vehicle is in space and place especially if you're driving a bigger vehicle and you don't have a great deal of experience somebody like me i've driven hundreds and hundreds of vehicles tractor trailer units and buses and those types of things so it's a bit easier for me to just jump in a new vehicle and kind of know where it is in space and place. I'm not going to know exactly where it is in space and place, but it's going to be a lot easier for me because of the grand, you know, the experience I've had driving different vehicles. Uh, driver, hey Rick, still looking for class one knowledge test uh, for BC. Yeah, okay, driver, that's my fault. It's just been a, kind of a crazy week. Um, just uh, thanks for reminding me, and I'll get I'll get at that for you. Uh, I'll try and get it up tomorrow at the latest. <laughs> Obnoxious actually had a question. What is a better greener fuel option hybrid or electric? Uh, obnoxious. Where are you in the world? That'll I'll be able to answer that question better for you Brian uh, if you fail parallel parking do you fail the whole test? Uh, it depends Brian uh, Most of the time if you are unsuccessful at the parallel parking depending on what you do So say for example, you're too far from the curb you're just going to lose some demerits for that. You're not going to fail your road test. However, if you hit the curb and the body of the vehicle rocks on the chassis, then yes. Or you knock the, the examiner out of the seat, then yes, you're not going to be successful on your road test. Or you push the rear tire up over the curb, yes, you're going to fail your road test. However, better to be a bit farther from the curb and just lose a couple of demerits than no, you're not going to fail a road test. Like I said, unless you, if you hit the curb, then yes, but most of the time you're just going to lose a few demerits. Okay, obnoxious, you're in Colorado. Uh, I would say obnoxious that you're going to be better off with a hybrid than you are with an electric. I would suggest uh, one of the videos that you watch, and I don't, I don't do this very often, but go over to Engineering Explained, and he has a video about living with an electric car. And that might give you some more information about living with an electric car, what it is like for chargers and those types of things. I would do a bit of research, but my personal feeling of where I live here in the interior of British Columbia, I would probably be better about going for uh, a hybrid car than I would for an electric car. As well, I know that a person I know who drives a Tesla, they were having some trouble with their Tesla in sub-zero temperatures. So for you there in Colorado, that's going to be a consideration in terms of the winter time that it, you might have some difficulties with an electric vehicle. I think, I think you might be better with a hybrid. Okay, uh, June, non-related question. Is there a difference between driving a city bus versus supersized tour charter bus? Yes, there is. 
the difference, June, the, the first very apparent difference that you're going to experience as a bus driver or as a driver of both of those two vehicles is on a transit bus, you're sitting in front of the steer tires. So the steer tires are here, you're sitting here. On a tour bus, you're behind the steer tires. So that's going to be a little weird for you, uh, depending on, you know, depending on what kind of tour or charter bus it is. Uh, some of them you will be sitting in front of the steer tires, but some of them you'll be sitting be behind the steer tires. So when you're driving, when you're um, driving those vehicles, when you get in the vehicle, see where the, the driver's seat is in relation to the steer tires on the vehicle, and that's going to uh, be a little bit different for you. All right, Ainsley, uh, can we talk tractor trailers? All right, what do you want to talk about tractor trailers, Ainsley? Are you working with a driving school and going towards your test? Because I, I just want to know where you kind of want me to talk about because I can help you out with that for sure. All right, let's see what else we got here. Okay, Sammy, I tried to drive yesterday. Yeah, okay, so the curb, so Corey put that video up for you as well. Uh, the video about, um, what's the video I'm looking for here? Learn to drive the, the, the 36 inch, one meter tall pylons. Uh, go and get some of those and work with those as well and put them up on both sides of the vehicle and just dry, try and drive as close as you can and that will give you a, uh, an idea of um, where your vehicle is in space and place. And Corey went and found the video for our engineering explained. Uh, there you go. Living with an electric car changed my mind. I didn't actually, I will confess, I did not watch that video, but I didn't get the sense that he was really... <laughs> happy with his electric car so have a look at that and that's a good place to start with that video okay uh just wondering if they will be emailed or put on your website no driver i'll put them on the website there for you okay so and i'll send you an email as soon as i get that done i'll just write myself a note here um bc class one questions there we go yeah, for those of us here in Canada, it's tax time. I don't know if uh, any of you down there are dealing with the IRS, but I've got to deal with CRA. The Canadian Revenue Agency. So, there we go. Uh, actually, do you have any tips when taking the restricted driver's permit for written exam? Okay, so you're looking for the learner's license? Yes, I have some ideas for you. Do not read the driver's manual from cover to cover. It's boring and will cause insomnia. You have to remember these things were written by bureaucrats. They're not written by people who know how to write. So it's very plain text and very uh, not interesting. All right. So one of the things you need to do is you need to learn how to do multiple choice questions. You need skills and strategies in place that will help you to do the multiple choice questions. So rather than reading the manual, what I counsel students to do is to go on the internet, find questions, multiple choice driving test questions, and do those questions. And when you finish up, don't use them as a measure of your ability, rather use them as a learning tool. So what that means is, is that identify the gaps in your knowledge by the questions you didn't get right, and then go to the manual and look in the manual for the specific topics that you got the questions wrong and look up that information. Now, some of the questions are going to be fairly general on the internet, so you're going to have to look up specific information. For example, uh, sunset and sunrise. There's a question on each test about when you should have your headlights on. It's not such a big deal anymore because now most newer vehicles are all equipped with automatic headlights that they come on as soon as the, uh, the ambient light begins to dim. But you, it's still a question on the test that you need to know, uh, you need to know, uh, is it a half an hour before sunrise, half an hour after sunset, those types of things. You need to know that for the purposes of the road test. So that specific information, you're going to have to look that up in the manual and know that. And as well, you know, most of the time uh, you're going to be dealing in kilometers or miles per hour, those types of things. You need to know things like it's what's the speed limit inside the city unless otherwise posted. It's 30 miles an hour or 50 kilometers an hour, depending on whether you're in Canada or the United States. All right, so know that, and that's the best way to do that, is to do the practice test questions, identify the gaps in your knowledge, go to the manual, look up the information you don't know, go back and do the multiple choice questions on the different websites, and when you're getting 80 to 90% consistently on the test, then 
uh, go and write the exam down at the licensing center and you, you have a very high chance of being successful on your written test. Uh, wondering what percentage going down a grade you use the engine retarder. Okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, thanks for just wondering if they, and there we go. Okay. I answered that question. I was wondering what percentage going down a grade do you use the engine retarder? Uh, I'll just come back to that driver one second. Samia, and my test question was mostly situational. Okay, so Samia, when you say situational questions, uh, they show you a picture and then they ask you a question about the picture. Is that what, what you're referring to? Okay, uh, okay, so driver, have a look at the video. There's a video on downhill braking in large vehicles. Uh, most of the time, in when you're driving if it's less than 10 percent and it's less than a mile or less than a kilometer you just put the engine brake on and just go down the hill you don't have to gear down if the grade is more than a mile or more than a kilometer and oftentimes if it's more than a kilometer or more than a mile it'll have a distance sign underneath the grade sign so if it's more than 10 percent grade more than double digits it's more than a mile or sorry, if it's more than a kilometer, more than a mile, then you're gonna use the retarder, you're gonna to have to gear down. And most of the time, if you're loaded with a fully loaded truck, uh, you're gonna gear down to fifth gear and start down over the top of the hill. And most of the time, these new engine retarders are really gonna hold you back. That's the best kind of way that you can start going down the hill. Because remember that saying, or the saying that I have, you can go down the hill a thousand times too slow, the one time you go too fast may be your last. So that's the way you do it. And as well, have a look at that video, give you a bit more explanation and those types of things. If you're running heavier than tandem tandem, so you got two axles on the back of the tractor and two axles on the trailer. If you're running heavier than that, you have uh, super bees or something like that, or you're running a tritum, you're probably gonna have to go down in fourth gear with the engine brake on full. But know that engine retarders on big trucks and buses and those types of things, the Technology has really, really improved and it's really good. It's not like it was 20 or 30 years ago where it barely worked. It was just there as a noisemaker. Now these engine retarders have gotten more quiet and they work better. So know that in terms of uh, engine retarders and engine brakes. Okay, uh, Bricks, if I recall, I think that he was pleasantly surprised with the experience, especially as an urban exclusive use case. Still had reservations, though. Lack of infrastructure, still limited distance, etc. Yes, so there are, so Corey's talking about the electric car and the experience that uh, engineering explained. I don't know what his name is because he never introduces himself in his videos, but it's engineering explained. He talked about electric vehicles. And yes, this is one of the problems I see with electric vehicles. Canada and the United States are one of the few countries in the world that actually use hydroelectric power to generate electricity. Now, this is my concern about electric vehicles. It's great that we have these alternatives for green energy and those types of things, but in most countries in the world, in China, in Australia, and other countries in the world, they burn coal or use nuclear power to generate electricity. And in my mind, uh, <laughs> with when you're burning coal to generate electricity to, to power a car, as opposed to using petrol, that's like saying, I'm a vegetarian because I eat meat. Because cows eat grass, therefore I'm a vegetarian because they eat grass and plants. <laughs> so the electric, uh, you know, the green electric car idea doesn't really work if you're not generating electricity from hydroelectricity dam, from hydro dams. Okay, so that's the only concern about it in terms of other places in the world. All right, <laughs> Danny here is saying I look like Thanos. I hope not. Thanos was kind of evil. <laughs> All right, there we go. So that's the, the part that I'm going to talk to you about in terms of uh, electric cars and having electric cars as an alternative. And actually, I was, I was talking to the guy at the tire shop the other day, uh, and he was telling me that he had a, a, a Highlander hybrid. Toyota Highlander and he said that it was really good on fuel uh, in the city it was it was exceptionally good and he said up to about 110 kilometers an hour which is about 65 68 miles an hour he said it was really good on the highway in terms of fuel and those types of things I think he was saying it was about 35 miles to the gallon which I think is about 12 is about 9 10 liters to the hundred uh, so he said it was exceptionally good and he said uh, in terms of a hybrid vehicle 
they're really good in and around cities. And I know uh, here in Canada, I don't know what the experience is in the United States, but most taxi cabs are, most of them are driving the Toyotas, the Toyota hybrids, which really help out in terms of fuel economy and those types of things around cities and whatnot. So uh, know that as well, okay? All right, so just a, a quick, uh, just quickly review uh, anybody who's going for a road test, regardless of what class of license you're going for and where you're going for in the world. And this comes back to the four basic components that I was talking about in terms of correctly merging onto a freeway. You have to have these four components in place in order to successfully make a, uh, to pass a road test. So you have to have space management, speed management, observation, and communication. So space management which is the fundamentals of defensive driving, it's the fundamentals of passing a road test, and it's the fundamentals of merging successfully onto a freeway or highway. Uh, space management, don't get near other road users, don't get near fixed objects, and you're gonna be successful on your road test. As well, stop at the correct stopping position at intersections, especially stop signed intersection. Stop before the stop line, stop before the crosswalk line, and if there, uh, neither of those conditions exist, then stop at the edge where the two roads meet without entering the intersection. And then when your following distance has to be three seconds minimum under ideal conditions, I know for some of the driving manuals, they're gonna say two seconds, but three seconds is better. And as traffic conditions deteriorate, increase your following distance. And the reason we measure in time is because as your speed increases, your distance from other vehicles increases as well. All right, don't block intersections. When you stop in traffic, stop so you can see the tires of the vehicle in front of you making clear contact with the pavement. That's how you measure how far you are, okay? So that's space management. Speed management, flow of traffic, posted speed limit, whichever is less is how fast you drive your vehicle. And when you turn corners and those types of things, get up to the posted speed limit as quickly as possible. Don't dawdle. You can lose points on your road test or potentially fail your road test for being too cautious or driving too slow. So know that driving too slow is as bad as driving too fast on a road test and you will be unsuccessful. As well, uh, if you are not kind of in the zone, so you're allowed kind of a three to five kilometer an hour, two to three mile an hour tolerance on either side of this posted speed limit. So say for example, it's 40 miles an hour, you need to sort of be you know, 38 to 42 kilometers an hour, 32 to 48 miles, or <laughs> 38 to 42 miles an hour, depending on what that is. Very quickly, you need to get the speed limit back to there, because speed control is one of the requirements of being able to pass a road test. Then, observation, you need to observe correctly on a road test, and Coral put up the video I put up a couple of weeks ago about moving your head. When you're driving your vehicle, now on a road test, you need to move your head. If you don't move your head, you're not observing correctly, right? You need to 90 degree shoulder, sh shoulder check, check the instrument panel, check the center mirror, the wing mirrors, and those types of things. So in a forward motion, you need to look far down the road in, check the, wing or the center mirror, down the road in, check the instrument panel, check your speed, down the road, both shoulders, scanning intersections, and then checking your uh, wing mirrors, and you need to do that scanning pattern every eight to 10 seconds when you're driving along. When you're turning or making a lateral movement, changing lanes or moving the vehicle sideways, you need to do shoulder check two times minimum before moving the vehicle. Remember, you need to observe, you need to look before you move the vehicle. If you move the vehicle and don't look, you're not gonna be successful on a road test, especially if you do it more than one or two times. All right, uh, so shoulder check twice, half a block before the turn and then Shoulder check again immediately before the turn. If you've been sitting there for a while at the intersection waiting to turn right or left or whatever, you might need to shoulder check two or three times. And unfortunately, last week I had a smart driver tell me that uh, he or she was unsuccessful on their road test and that the examiner had indicated at the end that they didn't have to shoulder check half a block before the turn. That is misinformation. <laughs> you must shoulder check a half a block before the turn. If you don't shoulder check approximately half a block before the turn, you're not gonna be successful on your road test. Remember, driving examiners, not all of them have all the information that they need and sometimes they will give you bad information. So that's observation. Oh, last piece on the observation is when you're reversing, reverse stall parking, backing up along a curb or whatever, 
uh, 360 degree scan before you start backing up and then make sure you're looking out the back window for the duration of backing up. And for approximately every vehicle length that you're backing up, stop the vehicle, do another 360 degree scan, make sure there aren't any road users around and then, and then continue backing up. And again, Corey will put the other video up for you there on reversing correctly for the purposes of a road test. And then finally, you have to communicate effectively with other traffic and other road users. And the way that we communicate in the vehicle is lights, signals, your horn, uh, hand gestures, make sure you use all five fingers. Don't tell anybody they're number one on a road test. Eye contact. So if you're unsure of what a pedestrian is doing or what a cyclist is doing or what a motorcycle rider or somebody on a scooter, make sure you get eye contact before you move the vehicle. Uh, so eye contact. And then finally, the last way that we communicate our intentions on the roadway is the position of our vehicle on the roadway. That's how you communicate effectively with other traffic. And those are the four fundamental components, regardless of what class of license you're taking or regardless of where you are in the world. And I go over these in more details and give you the specific uh, six weeks of training step by step that will make you successful on the road test. So have a look at Pasha Road Test first time over at the Smart Drive Test website and you can pick that up for about $27 with the 30% off coupon. And that will guarantee that you pass your road test as well. If you have any questions about your training, any questions about the course, you have access to me and I, on email and I will do what I can to guarantee that you're successful. As I said, it's ironclad guarantee. You just say, no, it didn't pass and we'll give you your money back. Okay. Jaden, my friend Jaden from Florida, how are you? Uh, when I was driving home, someone almost hit me and my friend, but luckily I swerved to the left lane to avoid the accident. Uh, and I blew the horn as well to tell him excellent. So you told him <laughs> he was there in your space and that's great that you managed your space effectively. You were able to, you had some space around you that you could move into because again, in purposes of defensive driving and the reason that I emphasize space management again and again and again, always leave yourself an out. That way, when something happens, that other drivers on the roadway do something unpredictably, for example, merge into your space, you have some place to go. Because remember, it's faster to drive into a, a space, an exit space, than it is to break. And so if you have some place that you can go to avoid a collision, it's going to be faster and safer than it is if you have to rely on your brakes. And I, I see it again and again and again, especially with uh, driving on highways or driving on freeways or interstates, if you watch other drivers and they're too close to the vehicles in front of them and you're following them, you'll see their brake lights coming on all the time. If you're driving on a highway or a freeway and you're touching the brakes all the time to slow down to adjust your speed, what that means is, is that you are too close to the vehicles in front of you. So simply back off because what happens is our what I tell students is, is that you want to drive your vehicle in the spaces between the other clusters of cars because you'll notice if you start observing on highways and freeways that cars always drive in clusters. For whatever reason, people don't like being alone. <laughs> I don't know what this is. But if you can position your vehicle so you're in the spaces between the clusters of vehicles and you can maintain a good three to five second following distance between you and other vehicles in front of you, you're going to find that the cluster of vehicles doesn't travel at a constant speed. They speed up and they slow down and they speed up and they slow down. Uh, so if you can maintain one speed and you have a good following distance, what's going to happen is you're going to find that the cluster goes along like this and you're going to kind of go like this as they speed up and slow down. But you're the one that keeps keeping the constant, sp constant speed. It's kind of like uh, the movie uh, Days of Thunder with Tom Cruise, if you watch that, where at the end of the movie, he's he's passing everybody and they're like, oh my God, you got to slow down because he was trying to keep a constant constant speed. And that's what they found out was is everybody else was slowing down, not him. So watch the movie. It's a good movie. It's, <laughs> it's about race car. It's about NASCAR. You know, they're making a left turn. They're making a left turn. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Okay, Joan, thank you so much. Ed, uh, not sure if this was asked before. If so, my apologies. Uh, went on a tractor trailer on an exit. How far should you, before you signal, slow and shift down? All right, so Ed, 
Excellent question. This is a really good question. And this isn't just for tractor trailer drivers. This is also for people who are driving larger units. Ideally, you don't want to start slowing down on the freeway or highway because you risk being rear ended. Okay, if you do have to slow down uh, because you're not sure what's going on in those types of things, put your four way flashes on to indicate to other traffic that you're going to be unpredictable on the freeway and you're getting off. Ideally, a little bit before the off ramp, you want to signal, but you want to maintain your speed on the freeway until you get onto the deceleration lane. That's why it's called a deceleration lane. So get completely into the deceleration lane, then start slowing down. You don't want to slow down on the highway or freeway. And from my experience of driving in North America, most of the time there's going to be ample space on the deceleration lane for you to slow down. Now, saying that, Ed, if you get off on the deceleration lane and you're like, oh my God, I don't have enough room to slow down, forget downshifting and just get on the brakes, push the clutch in, get on the brakes and get the vehicle slowed down. This is the other thing that a lot of students who are taking driver training with tractor trailer units think. They think that if they get into an emergency situation, they still got to gear down through all the gears. No, just leave it in gear, push in the clutch and brake hard and get the vehicle slowed down. And then when you come to a complete stop, then get your gear again or slow down to whatever speed. Uh, so for example, if you're doing 30 kilometers an hour, 40, 40 kilometers an hour, which is about 25 miles an hour, then just go back to fifth. Remember fifth is your happy gear. And 80% of the time, regardless of what speed you're going, you can get the transmission back into fifth gear. Okay. So to answer your question and answer, this is for everybody else who's merging on freeways and getting off the freeway. Don't start slowing down until you get onto that deceleration lane. That's its purpose is for you to reduce speed, not on the freeway because it's unsafe because you're committing an unpredictable act. And remember, Anytime you do something that's unpredictable, slowing down on freeways, for example, you are risking a crash. And I'll tell you a story about that. I was in Georgia and I'm on the interstate and you know, it's light traffic, very moderate traffic. And I'm going past the peach fields because as uh, the, the peach orchards rather, <laughs> uh, because as you know, for those of you who live in the States and been to Georgia, Georgia's the peach state, right? They have peach orchards everywhere. Well, it was kind of interesting. And I was kind of, you know, dazzled by the rows going off and diagonal lines off into the horizon. It was very majestic and romantic as I'm driving along in the interstate. And I'm on cruise control doing about 68 mile an hour going down the interstate. And I looked up and there is an old farmer in a rickety old GMC truck with wooden sides on it and he's doing about 50 miles he's doing 45 miles an hour on the interstate oh my god <laughs> it was kind of you know like my friend Jaden here who somebody moved into his space it's like also I'm just cruising along at 68 mile an hour on cruise and all of a sudden I look up and there's a there's a there's a truck right in front of me not going very fast at all well he that driver in the in the farm truck was being unpredictable on the interstate and I almost drove into the back of him I mean fortunately I kind of got you know, pulled out into the other lane, got around them and those types of things. But it was one of those very heart stopping moments, uh, in my, <laughs> in my life where I remember, uh, you know, wondering whether I was going to live, uh, to tell that experience or not. Blessed. How are you, my friend? Uh, there we go. So blessed is from Hawaii. There you are. All right. So we're going to wrap up here and, uh, remember sign up for the hundred K campaign and enter the draw for the hundred dollar fuel card over at the Smart Drive Test website if you've been successful in passing a road test. If you have any questions at all, uh, drop us a note, uh, share around on social media. That helps everybody out uh, in terms of passing a road test, being safer drivers, merging onto freeways safely, and those types of things. So we're going to leave it there for today. And uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to the live stream. And if you're watching on the replay, uh, let us know where you're tuning in from. If you have any questions or suggestions about uh, anything you want to know about driving, let us know and we'll help you out with that and if you have a road test coming up in the next couple of weeks good luck on your road test and remember pick the best answer not necessarily the right answer have a great day bye now